might wanna buckle up, baby. Punch it, I'm Jacob, and welcome to Life Speed. Somehow Palpatine returned. You've probably seen that clip a thousand times now. Ever since the Rise of Skywalker ended the Skywalker saga back in 2019, this one line has become immensely memeable. And for some, a prime example of bad writing. And I can understand that. But, see, I might just be the one person brave enough on the internet to actually say that I actually like this explanation. And The Rise of Skywalker is actually my second favorite Star Wars movie. Hold on, let... Let me explain. I know that it's probably one of the biggest and most boldest challenges on the entire internet right now to defend the Star Wars sequel trilogy. And my goal with this video isn't to change any minds or even to have you agree with me. Whether you love something or hate something, it's not your job to convince the entire world to agree with you. You're not going to convince me to dislike something that I already enjoy just as much as I'm not gonna help you like something that you already despise. And that's the coolest thing about Star Wars to me is that your least favorite thing is someone else's favorite. So let's take a deep dive into how Palpatine actually did return somehow and why it worked for me personally. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a tale of cloning, dark science, and secrets only the Sith knew. Although Balmont can probably would have never guessed it, he was actually absolutely right. We see right from the start on Exegol that Snoke was essentially a means for Palpatine to try and live on through clones, which actually further backs The Last Jedi's use of the character, essentially using Snoke as a catalyst to forward Kylo Ren into Supreme Leader, and also further into the dark side. There's just one problem with those Snoke clones though. They couldn't, um, they, they couldn't handle Palpatine's spirit. Palpatine was just that guy and had that dog in him. See, Palpatine by all accounts did die on the Death Star 2 at the end of Return of the Jedi. His ending there representing the end of the manipulation of the Skywalker family and for Anakin to redeem himself and save his son. And in The Rise of Skywalker, his demise represents an end to the tyranny that he inflicted onto the entire galaxy and his infamous legacy on the entire galaxy as a whole. To me, it doesn't ruin Vader's sacrifice or anything like that considering that Vader didn't defeat the Emperor to end the Empire he did it strictly to save his son. And it also creates two really cool parallels and two different endings that kind of mean similar and different things. But as Palpatine was falling down that reactor shaft, he used the force to transfer his essence into a clone body halfway across the galaxy. And this can all be found in the expanded novelization of The Rise of Skywalker by Ray Carson, which if you're a fan of the movie or maybe even not a fan of the movie, I highly recommend checking out and reading it, it completely changes the game. This is also shown in the film itself through very minor context clues, both visually and verbally in the movie. You'll die first. I have died before. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. And this has all retroactively been further developed in shows like The Mandalorian, Ahsoka, and more recently, The Bad Batch. I mean, it's called Project Necromancer for a reason. This also just kind of works for me considering that he knew of the Kaminoans and their cloning technology since before the prequels and Attack of the Clones, and also just his entire monologue in the Opera House in Revenge of the Sith, which is also called back to in The Mandalorian season three. All of this considered, I can absolutely buy that the ultimate evil of this series, the master manipulator himself, would use this knowledge and this technology in a sad attempt to cheat death. He's incredibly strong in the force and also the most convoluted man to ever live. He was a politician though, so I mean, the convoluted parts kind of expected. So 30 years after the events of Return of the Jedi, where can we find Palpatine? Well, we can find him hooked up to a mechanical claw, being injected constantly by that sweet, sweet Bacta, and is barely just kind of clinging on to life. I mean, bro had skeleton fingers, all on a planet called Exegol. See, Exegol is made up of Sith cultists existing in the unknown regions, and is also just one of the ancient homeworlds of the Sith. A perfect place for our boy Sheev to set up his eventual return three decades later, truly helping him live up to his name, The Phantom Menace. They even reference this in The Crawl, which like, that, that's awesome. Ever since I saw that movie on opening night, I thought it was a cool callback to episode one, and also just extremely pulpy in all the best ways. But what about all of those Star Destroyers? How did Palpatine even get all of those? Believe it or not, all of the Star Destroyers that make up the fleet in the final order was actually ordered to be constructed a whopping 11 years before Palpatine even became Emperor. Yeah, he was still, he he was still Chancellor of the Republic at this time, which is confirmed by the 
book Star Wars Timelines. During this time, the Empire is doing pretty much everything it can to remain relevant, putting Operation Cinder into effect, attempting to find Grand Admiral Thrawn, and even setting up a Shadow Council, trying to rebuild the Empire in any way that they can. Resistance, rebellion, defiance. These are concepts that cannot be allowed to persist. Until the Empire made their final stand on Jakku, where they were ultimately defeated. Or so we thought. Eventually, members of the Empire kind of banded together and eventually formed something called the First Order, led by a fully operational Supreme Leader Snow, which again is secretly our boy Sheev pulling the strings. So you essentially have the First Order and the Final Order. It's like bookends but evil. And I want to take this time to address the Bampa in the room. Is me saying all of this kind of proof that this isn't well written? Many people would probably say yes, considering that it's an afterthought. And a lot of this is just kind of retroactive to the film's initial release. But see, to me, I feel like I can just totally buy this. If you were to just kind of lay all of this out in front of me, even with the bare minimum context clues, I still think that it would work for me. And to me, this happens in Star Wars all the time to where one line that's insanely memeable one day eventually creates one of the coolest plot lines down the line. And personally, if you're asking me, I feel like we have enough of an explanation and context clues, both visually and verbally in the film itself, but also feel like everything that we've gotten in the comics, books, shows, and more have really added to the development of Palpatine's eventual return and is easily one of the most most eerie subplots in the entire saga. Again, if you don't like this movie or Palpatine's return at all, that's totally fine. But for everybody wondering how Palpatine returned, somehow, maybe this helped clear things up and also maybe help you look at it a little bit differently. I don't know. That all being said, thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, subscribe, share, and make sure you hit that bell for notifications. I've got a lot more videos on the way. And always until the next video, may the force be with you.